Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Sidana, and thank you, Dr. George, for having me here. It's a big honor uh, to be here. So I'm going to talk about AI in prostate imaging. So these are my disclosures. So um, I started to work in NIH about 17 years ago, and the biggest problem was given to me was underdiagnosis and overtreatment of prostate cancer. As you can see, uh, like uh, this is a whole month's uh, specimen of a patient, and we were doing biopsies kind of like in a random way uh, before the fusion technology appeared. So we, our main research was developing a smart biopsy system, and we utilized EM tracking. We published our results many times, and this followed by lots of different technologies, fixed arm, Im image, image fusion, inborn cognitive fusion. So at the end of the day, if you go to any country in the world, there is an MR guidance offered to, uh, the, to the patients, at least in one center. So this comes with some challenges. This comes with some heterogeneity. And to cover that heterogeneity as you know, uh, medical organizations or committees, we release some guidelines. These guidelines do not work in most instances. And we publish you know, second and sometimes third versions of these guidelines. And this is the three versions of the pirates. And I have to admit that it is helpful, but it is not uh, like solving the entire problem. So this is reflecting the problem. So this is a study that was done uh, from 26 centers in United States and North America and uh, Europe. And as you can see, the cancer detection uh, rates uh, using image guidance uh, on patient level is less than 50% in uh, more than half of these 26 academic centers. So this is a big problem. If this is the academic center situation, think about the community. So when we come to the NCI, we publish our results in every two, three years, and these are the most recent results of the PIRATES version 2.1 guided biopsies. It's about more than 450 patients. As you can see, so many lesions we biopsy in NIH, and one third of these patients are even biopsy naive. And our results are great. If you look at the patient level cancer detection rate, this is like, uh, like almost 90% detecting clinically significant disease in category five and category four, we are doing really good. When we publish these results, it's always higher performance compared to other centers and community practice, and there are several reasons because the same radiologist, the same urologist, the same IR specialist, the same pathologist, and the same engineer is handling the process. It's the perfect working machine, but it is not realistic. So the goal is uh, for me now is can we replicate this performance using artificial intelligence? So. In 2018, we started to work with Dr. Wood, Dr. Pinto, and uh, NVIDIA, a chip company, to build up an AI model. And uh, the first model was developed based on like more than 1,300 patients, and we utilized a cascaded algorithm approach, which means that you just feed the images into the AI model, and you just get the results for your uh, readout. So as you can see, the first prototype gave us about 63% lesion detection rate, more than half of these academic centers, totally unsupervised. This was the development paper. Then uh, we just we are in process of publishing our results. So in a prospective fashion, of course, 658 patients, and as you can see, uh, the AI model in a totally unsupervised supervised way compared to me, it is doing quite nice. And the cancer detection rates are uh, like very high. Sensitivity is very high, about 93%. And uh, the number of false positives, when you have an AI model, you have to check into that. You should have less than one false positive per patient. And in this model, the false positive rate is one in every other patient. Because you may have an AI model that can give you 10 lesions. You may biopsy 10 of them. And you can diagnose a cancer in that patient. But it is not cost effective, as you know. And the performance of this model is going up by increasing the Gleason grades. In Gleason grade 4 and 5, it is more than 90%, as you can see. Some examples. So this is a case uh, read by me in a prospective way, and I detected two lesions, one over here and another one over here, as you can see. So the AI model is giving you two things, the binary and the probability map. Doesn't matter. Binary is the final deal breaker here, and the AI thinks that there is a lesion over here on the right side. And guess what? 
this was a Gleason 7 cancer, and I added this false positive, uh, and the AI didn't detect the false positive. So it's a win for the AI over there, detected the lesion without a false positive. In another patient, I didn't report anything in this case. It was a PIRES-1, and Dr. Pinto, Dr. Wood, they did systematic biopsies, and as you can see, the AI detected something here on the left, and guess what? The systematic core was Gleason 7 over there, so AI beat me in that case. We don't always talk about our successes, but the failures. So in this one, I found this large lesion, maybe a mucinous subtype, who knows, but it is very difficult to see on T2, and the AI model couldn't find anything. By the way, this AI model works only in bioparametric images. You don't need contrast injection. So AI failed in this case. We are in a focal therapy meeting, and let's talk about our focal therapy failures. We challenged this AI with focal therapy failures. This was a case report to us, referred to us from outside NIH. He had cryotherapy in a private center. You can see those cryo changes. And he had elevated PSA. We put these images into AI, and AI shows me something here in the transition zone. And when you look at the diffusion couple, there is a lesion over here. So without any supervision, AI was able to segment out this distorted gland and find the lesion to me. So what happens in this AI model is it locates the prostate on images, it segments the gland and gives you a volume that you can use in your report and your fusion-guided biopsies, and it locates the lesions. If there is, you know, like more than one, it gives you more than one, segments the lesions and gives you a pirate score just for your information, for focal therapy failures, we don't use pirates, as Dr. Verma said. So now we solved the detection problem, at least you know in NIH by utilizing AI. What about the quality? It's a big problem. It is the biggest problem in prostate MRI world, and you need to be careful about that. So, so we developed an AI model for evaluating the T2-weighted image quality, and we just released our results last, last month. So this T2-weighted image, Quality-wise, no major signal problem. It looks perfect to me. Structures are distinguishable from each other, and we feed this image into the in-house developed AI model, deep learning model, and it, the model thinks that it is non-diagnostic. Now, you need to understand the AI world. It has to be an explainable AI model, and this is the explanation map. Wherever you see like brighter color, the AI thinks that there is a problem in that in the Im in that portion of the image. Okay, and we call them occlusion uh, occlusion uh, sensitivity maps. So, AI thinks that there is a problem over here, and. Our AI model is a 3D model, and when you look at the reconstructed image, the AI model thinks that the problem is always on these slides. And if you look at carefully, we are seeing the uh, stair step artifact. And this is mainly caused due to the Z direction motion. So when the patient's prostate moves, the patient cannot move. But when the rectum moves, that's why we don't want patients to consume caffeine. When the rectum moves, the prostate moves, and the image becomes non-diagnostic. And what happens is, uh, like, you need to see the image straightforward in the reconstructed, because you are reconstructing those images when you do your fusion-guided biopsies, okay? So uh, this image is not ideal for lesion burden estimation, staging, and prostate biopsies. That's what the uh, machine is telling us. So repeat the image. Our goal is to put this system into uh, scanners, and real-time, we want to give feedback to the technologists. Okay. What is the impact of this AI model in the real life? So this is a paper we published, I think, two weeks ago. And uh, we evaluated the impact of that T2-weighted quality evaluation AI model in biopsy performances. So Dr. Pinto, Dr. Wood biopsied like more than 615 patients, and we looked at their cancer detection rate versus the AI readout. Okay. This graph is very important, and as you can see, we have low quality and high quality MRIs. We have clinically significant cancer detection rates over here with PIRES categories. So in category four, if you look carefully, the low quality imaging uh, yields you a 32% cancer detection rate, whereas it is 52 in uh, higher quality images per AI, unsupervised fashion. 
So, uh, so clearly what I've shown you is impacting your cancer detection rate. And if you look at the systematic biopsy plus targeted biopsies, the difference is gone. So what is the message here? If your image quality is bad, then do the systematic biopsy in addition to your targeted biopsies. That's what this work is telling us. Okay. And this is, you know, like an like a image with a PIRES 4 score, but if you look, image is full of motion and the prostate is not looking straight. It is like mowing. All right, so AI doesn't work perfect, always. So uh, this is, these next slides are going to show you some examples about that. This was a case referred to me, 62-year-old African-American patient, PSA 2.8, inpatient. He had aplastic anemia and dysuria is the main complaint. We did the MRI, and as you can see, there's a very large lesion in the right peripheral zone and showing positivity in almost all uh, like pulse sequences. So let's go by the book, right apical mid peripheral zone lesion, PIRES 5 out of 5 with extra prosthetic extension, right? If you are, uh, like if you don't, if you are asked to read this, you have to read in this fashion, right? Well, I'm a curious uh, radiologist. I go to Pox and I spend some time and I went and looked at the FDG pet of this patient and FDG pet shows diffuse uptake. Then I dig a little bit more. There was a CT like f done a few days before and as you can see, there is an uptake area here. And I went back a little bit, one month, and I saw another CT scan in NIH. We do image patients quite frequently, and there is no uptake over here. There is no way in this world that a person can develop such a large tumor burden in one month. Biologically, I think it is not very possible in prostate world, right? So, so I revised my thinking, and it is acute prostatitis, unlikely to represent prostate cancer. That is my readout. So now, let's feed this into the AI and see what AI will tell. Before we do that, I'm sorry, I reported this and then they gave large spectrum antibiotics and like four weeks after this lesion was gone, it was an abscess, okay? Now, so let's feed this into the AI model and see what's gonna happen. So AI is reporting me a big lesion with higher probability of cancer over there, but we have to be honest, AI didn't know anything about this patient's like, uh, like, like, like age, background, PSA, accompanying diseases, and the symptoms, and more important than that, AI has never seen those things. So if you give AI just basic images, it will give you, uh, you know, the basic readout. So AI is not smart enough to, 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 to figure out this. And this is an AI model that, next topic, this is an AI model that most of you guys use in your daily life to do fusion-guided biopsies. There's an automated segmentation tool in those uh, like devices, and then you feed your images, and it's not very uncommon to see that type of segmentations, right? So this was an image done in March 2023, and look, the green is the whole gland, and the, <laughs> the red is the transition zone segmentation from the AI model. Uh, this is a very expensive tool, by the way. And the patient is a surveillance patient, and he came to us in 2021, uh, about like, like a year and a half ago, and look, AI did a perfect job, segmented the whole gland and the transition zone. So what has changed in, the, in between? We don't know. Patient's PSA was stable. We did the same imaging, same technology, same person reading, but AI failed in the follow-up, okay? So uh, AI models are not very stable. So. Next, the final slide. So where should we go with AI? I think um, we all know that strong AI models can be trained with, with big data. I've shown you a few examples of that. And even strong AI models can focus on solving one particular problem. You need cascaded models. You need to have end-to-end -to -end tools, especially you as urologist surgeons, you need that because you can't waste time with manual tasks anymore. And almost all AI models are using unidimensional data, like the prostate AI model doesn't consider the lab results or prior imaging or history. And AI model results are not connected to each other. A good example is Google Translate. Google Translate gives you the context sentence by sentence. There is no reading comprehension in those, so be, please be careful. And AI models results are not always stable. Even subtle adverse factors that we are not even aware of can impact the performance of that. 
So with that, that's my last slide. I've just represented the work of this amazing team and collaborators that you are seeing here. And I specifically uh, want to thank Dr. George and Dr. Sidana for having me here today. Thank you.